aware of this issue. I've been closely monitoring the, the actions of the Western Trust, in particular its engagement with families and carers. Indeed, I wrote recently to the Chief Executive of the Trust to make clear the seriousness with which I take the concerns that have been expressed to me by families and carers and to underline the need to restore confidence by resolving this issue in a robust and transparent way. While work to determine the extent of any underspend is ongoing, I think it's clear to all of us that urgent action needs is necessary in the shorter term. As part of this, the Western Trust has taken a number of steps to begin to address this issue. These include the development and partnership with families of a phased investment plan in adult learning disability services. In the immediate term, some three million is being invested to secure additional professional and support staff to enhance the community infrastructure in the Western Trust area and to address the priority needs of those transitioning into adult services by, among other things, increasing the day opportunities and day centre support. In addition, I understand that the Trust intends to develop an awareness programme and education sessions for families to continue to engage with MLAs and others as it progresses this crucial work. I have also been assured that the Trust will review how it communicates progress to all families affected and this is something that I will continue to monitor very closely. But I think we can all agree that all this progression is welcome. We can't be complacent and I have made it clear my expectation that more needs to be done. A continuing commitment is required right across the system to ensure that we are delivering the right services for people with a learning disability and their families. Therefore, the Trust will continue to develop a plan for further investments, working closely with the families and local representatives. As I made clear during the adjournment debate back in June, and as these recent investments now demonstrate, I will not be found wanting in terms of my support for people with a learning disability and their families. I am committed to working with the Trust and to others to ensure that the right services are in place, and I will continue to pay close attention to the progress that the Trust is making. Hello. Call Mr. McCrossan for his supplement. I thank the Minister for her answer, but the Minister has not answered my question. Minister, we're sitting here now. It is now uh, September. We have still no figure in relation to what the shortfall was. We still have no solutions. We still have no explanation. Minister, what is the figure? What is the solution? And what happened in the Trust? Where has the money went? Okay. Um, I think I did answer the question. Perhaps the member wasn't listening. I very clearly set out um, what's happening across the Trust. I very clearly set out that I took this up in my early days in office as a priority issue of something that I was concerned about. I very clearly set out how I have instructed the Trust to engage better with families and carers. I think that is key in terms of moving forward. I think there's been a breakdown of trust in the, in the area, and I think that is totally acceptable from the families and carers' point of view. But I think in moving forward, Families will be more interested in us actually finding a resolution to the issue than standing up and trying to uh, make a wee bit of circus antics in the chamber here. I think it's far, far more important that I actually deliver better services for all those people right across the Western Trust area. And I've set out how I am going to do that and how I have done that. I think that the amount of underspend that goes back for many, many years needs to be properly quantified. I've always said that. I said it back in June. And there's a piece of work going on within the board to make sure that that happens. I think it's important that we don't try to throw um, more flame on the fire in terms of um, trying to make headlines around figures. If it's £8 million, pound, let's get to the bottom of it and let's address the, the, what, ha what has happened in the past. And that's the piece of work that I've been involved myself in. So I think I very clearly set out my stall in terms of supporting the families in the Western Trust area. I've set out how the Trust has been instructed to actually engage better. And I've written actually the Chief Executive over the last number of weeks again because in my experience, in my um, conversation with families, they don't feel that it's even went far enough. So I'm okay to take that on board and I'm okay to engage with trust to make sure that, that happens because what we need to have is full transparency. We need to have that trust built up again and we need to have proper supports on the ground. That's more important to families than trying to score petty political points off other ministers. I ask the member not to barrack the minister. I call Mr. Ross Hussey. Thank you. Like the previous speaker, I, I'm not overly happy with the answer so far. Um, I met with MENCAP yesterday and we discussed the problems associated with adults with learning disabilities in West Tyrone. And the figure is not 8 million. We are talking possibly 110 million more that has been underspent in West Tyrone and the Western Health and Social Care Trust. Now, you mentioned the trust of the trust. Well, there is no trust with the parents of children with adult learning disabilities. So the, the question has to be, is the department taking this seriously? And is the department going to make the chief account executive accountable? Because so far, she has not been so. 
the member for, um, for his tone and for, and for his question. As I said to him in, in the previous adjournment debate, which you brought to the House, that I very clearly, in my first couple of days in office, when this issue was brought to my attention, I involved myself with the issue. I've continued to push the trust around what they're doing, particularly around the engagement issue with families, because I do think that's key. There is such a big breakdown of trust here for many, many years that needs to be addressed. So I want to make sure that I will hold the trust to account in terms of what they're doing, which is why even recently in the last number of weeks after speaking to families, that I've again instru instructed them to look again at how they're trying to uh, engage with families, because I don't think it's went far enough. And families are telling me that, so I want to be able to, to address that. So I think that in the, whilst we get to the bottom of the figure, and I think you know, we do need to get to the bottom of the figure so people can actually quantify the amount of money and how long this has been going on in terms of the underspend. Um, and we will get there, and the, and the board are actively working their way through that. But it is a quite difficult process. But, it, but I, do, I am assured that, that we will get there. And I won't um, stand behind. I, I'll be very forthright in terms of publishing that figure and making sure the families are, are aware of, of the figure. And I also will be very sure and make you know, real strong guarantees that the, the investment which we have now seen, so this additional £3 million, which has been put in place to start to improve the picture, because I don't want to wait till we have the final figure, I don't want to wait till that work's done. I want to make sure that we're already actually actively working on the ground and making changes. So th that is happening. Um, I think we've certainly got a way to go in terms of building up that trust, but I'm certainly committed to making sure that I play my role as Minister to make sure that that happens. Call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Hey, uh, Mr Speaker, and again I listen to what the Minister has said, and she sets out what she's planning to do or what she's intending to do and so forth. How do you intend to communicate that with the families on the ground? For any of the families that we talk to on the ground, they don't know anything of what is happening or what has taken place. So how do you as Minister intend to communicate that to these families, to let them know that you are interested and that you are planning to do something about this? Well, the members are probably aware that I have actually already met families and I will continue to engage with families and as I've said that whenever it comes to, um, well it is a fact, I have actually met families and will continue to. I have received representations from many of the elected representatives in West Tyrone, yourself included, and I'm very happy to keep engaging to make sure that we put out the facts, but I don't think it's helpful to scaremonger. I think that there's obviously a recognition here right across the board that there's a problem. There's a problem that needs to be addressed. I won't be found wanting in terms of my role in addressing that. I won't be found wanting in terms of my role of holding the trust to account and making sure that they properly engage with families. Because I don't believe that, um, even when we quantify the, the, the figure, in terms of going forward, we have to make services better. We have to improve things for those people with a learning disability. And the only way we can do that is proper communication. It's also about delivering services and designing services and supports that actually meet the needs of those people with a learning disability. And I'm very committed to making sure that in terms of transformation and going forward, that we actually co-design all services that are delivered for all those people out there who need to avail of health and social care. Call Ms. Joanne Bunting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question two, please. All referrals to trusts for an autism assessment are prioritised on the basis of clinical need, not their educational status. However, I am fully aware of the current waiting list position in the Belfast Trust and can assure the member that action is being taken to tackle this issue. Utilising the additional two million investment made available to all trusts from April, the 1st of April from this year. To be clear, I'm committing to getting these waiting lists down and ensuring that children and young people are assessed as quickly as possible. In the immediate term, additional capacity for assessments has been secured from additional hours and overtime clinics. In addition, arrangements are being developed for the assessment of children in the Belfast Trust to be undertaken by other trusts. Further, a recruitment process is currently underway to fill six new posts which, when complete, will substantially improve waiting list management in the Belfast Trust. However, sustained improvements will require substantial reform. So therefore, in parallel to the actions that I've just set out, the HSE Board is also in the process of agreeing with trusts a new regional model for autism services to improve both the diagnostic process and access to early intervention in line with current best practice and along with uh, NICE guidelines. This new model will optimise the scope for integration of a child development, emotional and mental health services, as well as working closer with the education sector to ensure that provision of coordinated and appropriate support for children with autism is in place. Ms Bunting for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. I'm grateful to the Minister for her answer and the action that she intends to take. Um, in East Belfast, Mr. Speaker, people are, parents are told that there's a 22-month wait for an assessment in the Broadway Centre. They wait for seven months and they check and they're told that now it's down, but it's still 20 months. Um, that's realistically a P6 child who's not going to be assessed until they're about to enter first year. Um, and I have parents at their wit's end. I'm sure the Minister's sympathetic. Um, 
but my question and to some extent my plea to her is um, I appreciate the action she intends to take and that she's outlined um, but how long can this go on um, and if necessary will she directly intervene to help particularly the Bradbury Centre alleviate um, these problems and address what are clearly enormous issues with regard to waiting lists and the prioritisation they're in. Thank you. I thank the member for, for, um, for that question. I think, I mean, absolutely, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that um, whilst we can see the situation in the Belfast Trust is obviously um, worse if you compare it to, to other trusts, so there are particular issues there. I've set out how the trust itself um, intends to deliver it, but I do think that we need to move to the point where we are looking at a more regional service and a more regional model approach. I think that would provide consistency right across the board, not just for autism, but for other disabilities also. I think that's going to be key. So I'll keep a close eye in terms of the, the investment um, in the Belfast Trust and actually how they are trying to address the problems. And I think that, you know, autism really is something that, you know, those children out there with autistic spectrum, the fact that we have so many more um, people coming forward for referral even shows that there's a lot of awareness out there now in relation to autism. I think that that's, that's whenever you look at the prevalence of autism over the last number of years, from 1.2% of the school age population right up to 2.3% this year, shows that there's obviously a growing demand. And I think that is testimony down to the great work that's been done around raising awareness so families actually know they can be referred and, and are seeking um, referral for assessment. I think that's really, really important. But the fact that we have um, a, a rise in demand for autism services and supports means that we need to obviously be continually tailoring the supports that actually are, are on offer. So we have the autism strategy and plan in place, but that obviously needs to be continually reviewed to make sure that we have services that are fit for purpose and make sure they meet the needs in the most timely manner as possible of, of all those children that need to be referred for assessment. I call Ms. Nicola Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I thank the Minister for her answers to date, and she has made reference to the um, dire waiting list in the Belfast area. Uh, just last week, uh, a mother, distraught mother, contacted me. Minister, she's just been told that her daughter has to wait up to 22 months for a diagnosis with a possible further one-year wait for intervention. She's currently watching. What is your direct advice to her? Is, to her? unacceptable that she has to wait that long. It's totally unacceptable that anybody has to wait um, that length of time, particularly for children to be referred for even assessment in the first place so we can put a proper package in place to support them. I wouldn't stand here for one minute and ever, ever defend that type of waiting list, whether it be for autistic services or whether it be for any other supports that are out there for anybody who needs health and social care. That's why we have to transform health and social care. That's why we can't keep doing things the way we are. That's why we need to move forward with the transformation piece. And I look forward to engaging with all the parties in this house about how we actually seriously engage on how we're going to transform how we deliver health and social care services. So I think that you know, whilst trusts continue to, we've had this additional investment of, of the two million pounds and right across all trusts to try and deal with the backlogs that are there. It's not one, I would never stand here and say it's acceptable that someone would have to wait that length of time. All I can say is to that parent is that I am going to work night and day and have done for the last four months since I've come into post to make sure that I transform health and social care to deliver better outcomes for that child and every other child who needs health and social care. Because Ms. Michelle Gilder knew. Uh, can I ask the Minister, uh, thank her first of all for her very fulsome reply, but also to ask for a progress report on the autism strategy and what are the next steps, please. I thank the member for um, her uh, question. As I said, the, there, there is a strategy in place and, and the, I suppose what that strategy aims to deliver is it, it creates a statutory obligation to prepare, review and monitor the implementation of um, across the departmental strategy. That was what came about as a result of the Autism Act. And there's a number of themes right across the strategy and, and all are very relevant. I think we can all point to actually really good examples of things that have happened as a result of the strategy where we have more autism training and frontline staff, educational professionals, youth workers. We have one-stop shops developed by the Northern and Belfast Trust for, for adults to obtain employment and careers advice. There's been adjustments made to the theory and practical driving test. There's a number of things I think that we can point to as good examples, but as I, what I believe that we need to do, we need to continually keep the strategy under review. I think that it's important that um, the, the strategy is cross-departmental in, in nature. It's got an action plan. So I think that in partnership with stakeholders and those people out there who are actually involved with families and carers day and daily, we need to plug the gaps that are there. And the way that can be done is by um, informing ourselves with the views of both those people with autism, their families, their carers, and those community and voluntary groups that actually work um, with, 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 the, with the sector. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Health Minister why there is a 22-month wait for autism assessments for children in Belfast and how exactly the £2 million investment has been spent and why it hasn't reduced those waiting lists? 
Well, as I said earlier, the prevalence in autism in school age population has continued to increase if you compare the, the figures which I talked about. If you look at, um, in this year alone, there's been a 17% increase of, of the number of referrals coming forward for assessment. So I think that is testimony to um, the work that's been done around raising awareness and people actually being more alert to the fact that autism uh, exists and, that, and they're entitled to get a referral for assessment. So I think when you, when you look at that, that, that in itself creates obviously a, a demand for services. So it's so important that um, we continue to review the strategy and make sure that we are fit for purpose and that we can actually meet the, the need that's there. In relation to the £2 million that was, that was invested, um, there was uh, and there is good progress being made, but it's not, we haven't got there yet. We're far from it if you look at that type of waiting list. In terms of the Belfast Trust itself um, and, and their share of the £2 million, they received £418,940, which was actually to um, pay for staff. It, and it, was, it paid for a range of things, but it, it paid for staff um, to work overtime. But that's not even a sustainable approach. We have to actually recruit and make sure that we have ongoing recruitment and a proper workforce that can actually deliver the assessments that, that need to happen. So um, I'm going to continue to monitor the progress that's been made, but I mean, we seriously have a way to go. And I'm also, and I've committed to, um, when I met Autism NI the other day, I actually committed to working more with the community and voluntary sector around the work that they do also. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. The term looked after children refers to a diverse group that varies in terms of age, the reason for being looked after, age of first entry into the care system, and duration in care. While some looked after children and young people can go on to enjoy success as a group, outcomes, including health and educational outcomes, tend to fall significantly below those of the general population. In my term as Health Minister, I'm determined to give these children and young people the priority they deserve and keep them with my duties as their corporate parent. I want a care system where fewer children need to become looked after, where quicker decisions are made about where they live permanently, where there are improved outcomes for each and every child in every area in, of their lives, including their physical, mental and emotional health and well-being and their educational attainment. I also want to ensure that everything possible is done to secure their successful transition into adult life. It's a commitment that I can't deliver alone. I will need the help of the wider executive, which, as reflected in the draft programme for government, has also agreed to improve support for looked after children. To deliver on the programme for government commitment and in the context of the executive's wider children's strategy, my department is developing a strategy which is specific to looked after children. The LAC strategy will be reinforced by a family support strategy also being developed by my department. Both those strategies are being developed on a co-designed basis and we intend to consult on a draft lack strategy and support and action plan early next year. Where legislation is required to deliver any of our strategic aims for looked after children, this will be done by way of an, of an adoption and children's bill. I have already made public my intention to bring forward a bill in the current mandate. I want to ensure that looked after children are given the opportunity to shape the strategy. Some of this will be done directly through me. I have already met with a group of looked after children in my time in office and I'm committed to ongoing engagement. I'm also committed to providing members with the opportunity to engage directly with looked after children and I'm currently considering how this can be done to best effect. Also in their roles as corporate parents, I've asked all five trusts to consider establishing formal engagement mechanisms to facilitate direct engagement with looked after children in their areas. I accept that a looked after strategy may require some additional investment either to test new ways of working or extend existing supports available to looked after children. I've already made a number of new investments. For example, I've invested 500,000 in the Extend the Go and the Extra Mile scheme to, to allow more young people in foster care to enable them to remain with their supported family until they reach the age of 21. And I've also invested an additional 2 million in fostering services in response to service pressures and a further 150,000 to enhance therapeutic support for looked after children, particularly those who have suffered or been exposed to trauma. I thank the member for his interest in looked after children, recommend that other members show a similar interest, and I look forward to working with the Executive and the Assembly to support families in the North to stay together, and when they make decisions to take children into care, that we provide a system of care that nurtures them, acts in their best interest at all times, and secures the, the best possible outcomes for them. Just let me remind the Minister of the two minute rule. <laughs> Mr. Maskey for a supplementary. Thank you, Gorman. I get Concurla and. Uh, I want to thank the Minister for that very comprehensive response. I had wanted to ask that the supplementary if uh, looked after children are indeed being engaged with, but clearly that is the case. And could I ask the Minister, therefore, on the, in the spirit of which he has already responded comprehensively, that if she to continue to uh, update the House in the future and, and as to regards to the success of that engagement with looked after children themselves? 
Yes, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. I mean, I think, it, it, as I told the, the group of children that I met, that um, they may be small in number, but they're high in terms of the priority of us as an executive wanting to deliver better outcomes for them. Um, but right across the field, whether it be in relation to health or education, um, or just them feeling comfortable in, in their home environment. I think it's important that we talk with them, and they very clearly articulated to me very well articulated to me um, what they feel needs to happen in, in terms of services and how we actually support them. So I'm very keen to continue that engagement. And as I said, I've actually asked trusts to consider some sort of formal mechanism where they can engage with children in care in their area. And I'm also going to try and provide an opportunity here in the Assembly for MLAs to um, engage with these children who find themselves in care. Well, Mr. Justin McNulty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her answers to this point. Can the Minister outline whether she intends to bring forward legislation, um, new adoption of fostering legislation, to ensure that looked-after children are placed in a safe and caring environment, rather than being kept in institutional care and other temporary care settings? I do uh, intend to bring forward an adoption on children's bill. I um, have very said that publicly that I intend to um, bring a bill to the executive and then um, go out to make sure that we have uh, to consultation to make sure that we have the most efficient and robust as possible legislation in place that makes sure that we support um, children who find themselves in that situation. So I think that the bill is going to strengthen um, support mechanisms that are involved for those that are involved in. in um, in terms of adoption, so I'm very keen to get executive endorsement of that, and I'm going to do that over the coming weeks. Call Mr. Jonathan Bell. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister and can I thank the work that her department is doing for looked after children? But can she give us a current status of the educational gap uh, that is emerging between looked after children and the current uh, cohort of children in the general population? And secondly, can she assure the house? That given that many of these children have experienced such severe trauma and disruption to their lives, and given that there's such a short period of time to actually get it right, that where necessary extra resources will be put in to help those looked after children achieve the life opportunities that many of us took for granted. And that's what the strategy is going to be about. There will obviously be a cost factor associated with the strategy, but as I said, when I uh, engage with the children in care, uh, the group of children in care that I, that I did have the opportunity to meet, um, they, they very clearly said to me that the, uh, set out the change they feel needs to happen. I actually agree with them, but I've also committed to them that we will design and make sure we put proper <coughs> legislation in place that allows all those things to happen speedily. There shouldn't be any delays in terms of processes and, and making sure that people are in place in proper um, homes and proper placements and, and given every um, support possible. The facts speak for themselves around the educational attainment, health outcomes, uh, potential mental health problems, all those things that, that we know are, are relevant to children in care. So it's so, so important that we support these young people in terms of the, their life journey. Well, Ms. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much. Um, could I ask the Minister if she could confirm if children being cared for by Kith and Ken will be considered formally within our department's considerations for looked after children? children being cared Oh, yes, absolutely. We're going to take all that into consideration. I think it's important that we support, um, and there's been a lot of focus and media attention recently in relation to kinship, and I think that's so, so important. The family support network is, is key, so yes, absolutely, it'll all be considered. Call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Question four, Mr. Speaker. The latest provisional figures for outpatients waiting longer than 52 weeks for their first consultant-led appointment show that at the 31st of July 2016, the most recent figures that are available to me there were 19,849 patients waiting in the Belfast Trust, 1,698 patients in the Northern Trust, 4,689 in the Southern, Southeastern Trust, 3,278 patients in the Southern Trust, and 4,104 patients in the Western Trust. I wish to reiterate that tackling excessive waiting times is high on my agenda for delivering improvements in the health service, and I want to assure patients and their families again that long waiting times are completely unacceptable to me, and I understand the worry and the stress that people feel when they're waiting to hear when they'll be seen. To be able to deliver sustainable improvements in waiting times, we must take action that addresses the root causes of the problem. Short-term measures to address immediate pressures on their own will not be enough. Unfortunately, there is no quick fix to this. The position that I inherited in May was one of a continuing deterioration in waiting times. This is just one of the many challenges that is facing the health service here, and the need for change is very clear. As I said before, I will need time to, and new investment in order to deliver the radical change necessary to deliver sustained, long-term improvement. 
As I have also said before, my policy would be to adopt a balanced approach to, further, to taking further short-term action when funding is available, combined with longer-term change. I am currently considering the Export Panel's report, which makes very clear the need for change. I am looking forward to setting out my vision for health and social care in over the number of weeks, next number of weeks, which will include the issue of elective um, care waiting times. The health service here will continue to do its utmost within the resources it has available to it to ensure the clinical needs of patients are met and that safe, patient safety is maintained and that patients do not wait any longer than they have to. Mr Nesbitt, first supplementary. If, uh, if I heard the Minister right, that sounds like something like 34,000 people in this small country waiting more than 52 weeks for their first consultant-led uh, appointment. The Minister will know that the longer patients are forced to wait for treatment, the more likely it is, unfortunately, they will come to harm. So why is it that this unprecedented crisis is escalating? Why is it getting worse? I think there are a number of factors. I think that um, we have an ageing population. People are living longer with more complex needs, so obviously need more supports. I think that expectations, individuals' expectations, patients' expectations have risen, and rightly so. Um, I think that um, the demand for services is obviously greater, and if you refer back to the, the previous question in relation to autism, and then if you look at the numbers and stats of, of, of the number of people who have been referred for assessments, so it shows there's a rising demand for our health service. It also very clearly points to the fact why we need to transform health and social care, because obviously we can't keep doing things the same way and expecting a different outcome. And the only way we're going to be able to seriously, seriously address and make the investments that we need to is if we actually reform how we do things. I don't think the, the the situation at present can continue. I think all parties actually recognised that whenever they all signed up to the principles of Professor Van Gogh's report and, and, and his, when he set out to do his piece of work along with the expert panel. So I think that if you look at all those factors that have led to um, the, the, the reasons that we have ourselves with the situation that were waiting lists are absolutely, 100 per cent, totally unacceptable. We need to rectify that problem. I'm certainly going to, to do that, and I've set out on a number of occasions to this House how I intend to do that in the short term, <coughs> the medium term, and the longer term. Call Mr. Mark Durkin. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, regardless of what the expert panel says, I don't think we need an expert panel to tell us about the need for change. Nothing makes that clearer or should make that clearer to us than these horrific uh, figures themselves. I would like to ask the, the Minister if she is aware of instances where individuals and families are actually putting themselves into debt so that they can receive private care, given how long they are being told they will have to wait for these consultant-led appointments. Yes, I am. I am aware of many people, even in my own constituency, people are turning that way because they can't get access as quickly as they would like to. And that's, that's why we do have to actually transform how we deliver health and social care. And whilst there's been plenty of talk about it in the past, and there's been report after report which points to the challenges that are there within the health and social care system, but we actually need real action. We actually need to deliver transformation. And that's what I'm committed to doing. So I think that I've set out my stall in relation to how we need to in the, in the short term and the immediate term, but the longer term picture here is we have to change how we deliver services. We have to be real about delivering better outcomes for people, and the only way we're going to do that is if we stop doing things the way we're doing, if we stop getting caught up in the, in, in the black hole, which is health. You could, you could, I, I could get, the Finance Minister could give me millions upon millions of pounds tomorrow, but I am not prepared to invest that money to keep doing things the way we have been doing. We need proper transformation. We need real transformation, and that's going to be my priority as Minister for Health. We have to deliver better outcomes, and the only way we're going to do that is with that real and meaningful transformation. And as I said, I look forward to all the parties in this House actually supporting me in that transformation and taking the difficult decisions that need to be made, because that's the only way we're going to deliver better outcomes, and that's the only way that we can deliver proper uh, in terms of time frames, making sure people are not waiting for ridiculous amounts of time to get assessment and get treatment. So that's going to be a priority. I think that. Um, as I said, I've set out many times how I, how I intend to do that. It's certainly a priority for me. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move to topical questions. I call Ms Sinead Bradley. I'd like to thank the Minister for her answer so far. But in relation to the Bingoa report, will it address the lack of provision of carers in the community? Yes, we're going to look at... at as a result of um, the piece of work that was done out by the expert panel, I have said I am going to use that as a foundation to actually to drive forward on the transformation. And for me, we have to look at everything. The focus uh, has always been on the acute end of things and the acute services. We have to tackle the root cause of why people get sick. We have to be real about investment in primary care. And a part of primary care is 
obviously domiciliary care workers who are, uh, if you look in, in rural areas, there's particular challenges around trying to recruit people to actually work in domiciliary care. There's creating backlogs in hospitals because people can't be um, discharged from hospital because there's no care package in place. So these are the things that we seriously need to address. So yes, the expert panel's work and my response to it and my vision and my transformation piece for going forward will also address um, how we're going to deal with social care. Ms Bradley, for supplementary. Thank you. Uh, the Minister rightly pointed out, particularly in rural areas, there is a real shortage of care workers and organisations with good intentions are unable to provide the care packages required. Has the Minister got some uh, intuitive or some way that she's going to address, particularly the, the rural areas, in making sure rural people are not disadvantaged in access to care packages at home? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's going to be key in going forward. If you look across all the trusts, they will, they will employ so many domiciliary care workers in-house, paid directly by the trust. They will also buy in so much of domiciliary care service from the independent sector. I don't think that's a good enough position. I want to see trusts employing more people in-house. Domiciliary care workers are the lowest paid workers in the health service. They Quite often, if they work for the independent sector, they won't get travel costs. They're expected to go into every rural country road to go and see people who need their support, but they're expected to do that without any mileage. I don't think that's acceptable. If we want to support, if we want to provide better outcomes, if we want to support people closer to home and, and allow old, older people to stay in their homes and not have the need for residential care, etc., then we should be supporting the workforce to actually to be there to do it. So that's certainly where I want to go. That's the direction of travel I intend to take in relation to making sure that we support um, domiciliary care workers, but also in turn that's obviously going to benefit the patient. Call Mr. John O'Dowd. Uh, thank you, Ken Collier. Uh, I'd like to ask the Minister in relation to out-of-Irish services and what the current picture is in regards to out-of-Irish services across the north in relation to GP services. Well, GP services are, and out-of-Irish services are under um, significant pressure, and the Department and the Health and Social Care Board have been working with out-of-Irish um, providers right across uh, the north to try and address the challenges that are facing the service. In 15-16, an additional £3.1 was made available to help build capacity in GP out of our services, with a further £1.1 million um, made available to help out of our providers meet the increased demand for services over winter months and the Easter period. So I think there are significant challenges which we need to continually review, review and work our way through. Mr O'Dowd, first supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware that there has been particular commentary in relation to out of Irish services being provided in the Southern Trust area. Would she give further detail in regards to that uh, area? Yes, the, the Southern Health and Social Care Trust has been facing significant challenges in the provision of the out of Irish service. And as with the other out of Irish providers, there are a number of reasons um, for that, including difficulties in recruiting and also in retention of GPs in order to maintain the provision. The Southern Health and Social Care Trust provides GP out of ours from five bases in Armagh, Craigavon, Dungallon, Urie and Kilkeel. And this configuration is intended to ensure that the vast majority of residents in that trust area have access to out of ours um, base should a face-to-face -face appointment be required. There may be occasions where the Southern Trust has insufficient number of GPs and that has happened. And they've also an insufficient number of other staff available to deliver out of ours services from all of those five bases. And in those circumstances, the Trust um, continues to use contingency measures which may require consolidating resources in the out of hours basis where there is um, patient demand is the greatest. So in terms of um, in all those circumstances it has to be patient safety has to be um, first and foremost and the trust takes that into, into account. The trust also, the Southern Trust also recently um, has taken a number of actions to support the out of hours service and things like for example the introduction of nurse practitioners, clinical pharmacists to support GPs in managing the service, um, ongoing recruitment campaigns for GPs the provision of additional funding to boost capacity at busy times and also supporting flexible shifts in, in shift hours and bases to work from. So I think there's a body of work going on, but I think that um, clearly there has been particular challenges in the Southern Trust. Call Ms. Carla Lockhart. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. And can I ask the Minister, uh, can she outline to this House her commitment to the basically the drawing up of a cancer strategy for Northern Ireland. I recently had the, the pleasure of visiting the research facilities in Belfast and I was quite taken with the fact that Northern Ireland is the only part of the United Kingdom that doesn't have a cancer strategy. So I would just like her to outline what her commitment is around that. Well, just to say, I suppose meeting the, challenge, the challenges that are posed by cancer is obviously a priority um, for me and will continue to be um, one of the highest priorities. And I think that we've made great strides in tackling cancer and have been, there's been significant progress um, in the past decade since the Cancer Centre opened in, in Belfast City Hospital. 
But I think that we need to obviously continue to drive forward continual progress, and I and my department are committed to working in partnership with others to provide the best cancer services that we can. So um, I, the issue of the cancer, a comprehensive cancer strategy has been raised with me, and I am given it some consideration. I actually attended an event which the chair of the committee um, hosted a few months ago, and I did say that I would give it due consideration. Ms Lockhart for a supplementary. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for uh, that commitment. However, I would like to just drive home to her the fact that I believe in Northern Ireland we need a strategy, a comprehensive strategy, as you, uh, the terminology that you used, to try and capture all of the statistics and all of the needs around cancer. So I would encourage and, and really lobby you to give this House a clear commitment that you will work towards the commissioning of a cancer strategy in Northern Ireland. I thank, I thank the member for her comments and I, and I certainly will take them on board. Um, I think that there is there appears to be a growing, I suppose, demand for a, a comprehensive strategy. And I said I haven't ruled it out. I've actually officials are currently engaged in a round of discussion with the community and voluntary sector and those people out there who actually um, the major charities that provide brilliant support and research. So we're sort of looking at determining if there's any support that could be provided from the community and voluntary sector also around um, if we decided that we needed to progress a review here. So I haven't ruled it out. I'm certainly um, still open to the idea, but let's just I think do a bit more homework in relation to it. Call Mr. Sean Lynch. Can I ask the Minister? She has engaged with union and staff representatives since becoming Minister. Thank you. Um, yes, since I've taken up the post of um, Health Minister, I've made it very clear that I want to listen and I want to hear the views from the grassroots. And where I can, I want to make changes that reflect those ideas. I've had a number of meetings with trade unions since coming into office, and um, I intend to have further introductory meetings lined up over the, I have further meetings lined up over the coming months to ensure that I have an opportunity to hear from all the staff representative bodies. Mr Lynch for supplementary. And I welcome the meeting some the Minister has had. How will she continue to uh, engage with staff, uh, particularly in the light of the upcoming transformation uh, process? I think we're in a, it's so important, even more so than ever before, that we continue to engage with trade unions. And I think that it, it's so significantly important now, given that we're about to embark on a process of transformation. And obviously, I, I always say this, and it is, it's a genuine, I think most people in the House actually would share the, the same sentiment, that the health service, the best asset we have in the health service is the workforce. So it's so, so important that they're given ownership of the changes that we're trying to make. It's so important that they feel that they're listened to because they're on the front line delivering services. I have recently established the, um, a, a new health partnership forum, and I'm going to chair, personally chair the first meeting. I think that that shows that I'm really serious about engaging with trade union side. I think it's significant that we um, develop shared aims and, and a shared approach to actually how we bring forward transformation, because transformation will mean change. And I think that it's so important that we actually, the people understand why we're making change, that it's not always just about saving money, that it's, all, that it's genuinely about creating better outcomes for people. And I think the best way to do that is to make sure that there's a wholesome um, engagement at every level with, with, with the workforce. So I intend to um, host the first meeting of the Health Partnership Forum, which will bring together all the leaders across the department, but also it will bring together um, all the leaders across HSE, or, or across the trade union representation. And I just think that is going to be a major significant um, piece of work and, and key and vital for me, particularly in terms of trying to bring forward the transformation and for people to understand why we're doing it and that it's for the best reasons and also for people to understand and take ownership of the process. Well, Mr Christopher Stalford. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, can the Minister outline the plans that she has to ensure adequate accident and emergency coverage throughout the City of Belfast? Well, obviously the Belfast Trust leads in relation to adequate um, uh, services, but I suppose it comes back to the, co the conversation which runs through every question which I've answered today. We have to transform how we do things if we're going to be able to deal with, um, with, with making sure that we have better outcomes for people, make sure we don't have people sitting in A&Es for a very long time. We have a lot of work to do around awareness, why people actually present an A&E in the first place. You know, is it the most appropriate place for them to go? Should they be at the minor injuries unit? You know, I think that we need to look at all those things in the round. I think that, um, obviously, um, Belfast A&Es are extremely busy. Um, the staff there do excellent work and, and are very much challenged day and daily. But I think that um, we have to seriously um, transform how we deliver health and social care so we don't have people who, quite frankly, sometimes are presenting at A&E because they can't get a GP appointment or they can't um, because they have ongoing conditions and they're on waiting list to be seen. 
Mr. Stalford for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Minister give us an update on how the services at the Royals ANE are working in terms of taking up the slack from the decision taken in terms of ANE provision at the City Hospital? I don't have any details in relation to that. There's nothing in my desk that suggests that there's anything particular to, for, for me to be worried about. Um, I will, um, I suppose, I'll go and, and look into it and I can actually respond to the member in writing, but I don't have any detail with me in relation to any particular challenges or any particular problems. Well, Mrs. Emma Little Pingali. The Minister will be aware of the concerns raised around the breast cancer uh, waiting list, particularly in the Belfast uh, Trust over the course of the last 12 months. Can the Minister give an update as to progress in uh, ensuring that people can see uh, a specialist as soon as possible? But also, when I have recently met with Action Cancer, a charity within South Belfast but working right across Northern Ireland, who deal with uh, about 11,000 uh, breast screening for people in Northern Ireland every year. Um, and I'm sure that the, the uh, Minister would agree with me that that's a very valuable service, particularly in light of the pressures on that system within the Trust. Absolutely. I think it's invaluable. And um, what they do is amazing. And I think that they actually get out and they're on the ground and they're in communities and they're meeting with people. I just think that's really, really important. And, um, but just by way of you know, the breast cancer <coughs> in the Belfast Trust and, and the, the performance, I suppose, the, I think the Belfast um, Trust performance is improving. Um, I think the latest stats from July of this year indicate that 87% of patients were seen within 14 days. But obviously we want to meet the, the target that is 100% of patients being seen within 14 days. Extremely worrying time for a woman who's been referred and needs to be, needs to be assessed. So there's a number of particular challenges in the Belfast Trust around um, radiologists, around um, staff vacancies, and I think that um, there, there are things which the Trust are working to make sure that they secure additional capacity to be able to, to deal with, with, with the cases that are being referred. Longer term, there's a need to have sustainable breast service in place right across um, the north to make sure the patients are seen within the time scales that have been set out in the recommended 14 days. I think that's, that's vital. That's whenever we can say what we're doing is excellent. Mrs. Little Pangali for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer, and I'm sure she would agree that that 11,000 screenings it really does alleviate a lot of pressure. And although it isn't traditional for the Department of Health to fund third sector capital bills, there have been examples of that in the past. For example, with the MenCap uh, new build, also in South Belfast, and also with the uh, hospice. Um, I would ask the Minister, and uh, you know, could she take this away and take a look at the issue? She may be aware that Action Cancer has purchased a building um, in order to uh, be able to expand their services, including their breast screening um, that they carry out. Um, and I would ask the Minister, could you take that away and look at, you know, are there any opportunities for potential funding, despite it being not the usual way that the Department of Health does fund this, given that that has happened in the past with MenCap and the hospice? Okay, um, certainly yes. I'm, I'm happy to take it away and give it some consideration to see if, if there is a way. They, as I totally um, support everything you've said in relation to what they do. They're absolutely amazing in what they do, and they're reaching so many women. And if I can be part of supporting that work, um, it helps me to deliver better outcomes for patients, and, and I think that that's something that we all want to work together. And the one thing I suppose just to say that the breast cancer survival rates here are actually excellent. We are actually are leading the way, and I think that's something that we can be very proud of. I think quite often, whenever we talk about health and social care, everybody focuses on the negative, and I think it's important sometimes that we sing loud about the good things that actually happen. And there are many, many good things. There are many, many staff on the ground providing excellent services and delivering better outcomes for people. And I think that sometimes it's important that we don't just focus on the negative whilst we have to address the challenges that there are. We should also sing really loud about what is excellent in the health and social care services. Ms Nicola Mallon is not in her place. Ms Carol McCullen is not in her place. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong uh, for a quick question. This will be very quick, Mr Speaker. Thank you very much. Just to ask the Minister of Health if she can confirm that people with blue badges can park in all hospital health centres and any other car park while their badge is out of date during the current period of backlog. I'm quite sure they can, but I will clarify that. I can't see any reason why, they wouldn't be, why that would be a problem. Mr. William Marwin is not in his place. A point of order. Mr. Speaker, during the course of the Finance Minister's answer to a question during question time, the member made comments about a former member of this House and, the cur and a current SDLP public representative. Can I ask the Speaker to review those comments, make a ruling on whether they were in order, and if the Speaker finds that they were not uh, in order, to ask the Minister to withdraw, th withdraw his remarks and apologise in the Chamber? I have noted your comments. Uh... Coincidentally, in the back of the last member's contribution. Um, 
I know the, the, the Speaker, and I want to thank you for this, for, for admonishing Mr McCross and for the manner in which he uh, put his questions to Minister O'Neill. But I certainly felt that his words, the tone and the manner in which he put his questions were hectoring, bordering on bullying, and I don't think the member would want to have that as a reputation. So could I ask the Speaker yourself to review again the manner in which those questions were put and maybe have a conversation with Mr McCross and the real, to make him understand that there is a manner of addressing colleagues in this chamber? I think I have already dealt with that one, Mr Maskey, but uh, it's while we change the top table.